bit about myself. My name is Rianne Frank. I'm, I'm in the sociology department um, here at Ohio State. Um, I do research on immigration and, and the health of immigrants, and in particular, I'm interested in the case of Mexico. So some of the, um, um, we'll talk broadly about the Hispanic and Latino population, but then I have some uh, case studies from um, Mexico. Um, so before we start talking about migration and health, I am, although I'm a sociologist, my area within sociology is demography. So I really like to talk about demographic trends, and I really, really like to talk about demographic um, trends that have to do with immigration. So I know you guys already had that section, but um, I could not help when I was putting this presentation together to slip in um, some slides on the recent demographic trends in immigration. So um, if you guys will for a little bit, I just want to talk um, about a couple of these. Uh, so again, this might be repeat from what you guys have gotten before, but um, I feel like the case of um, immigration to the United States is so fascinating that it doesn't hurt to hear it multiple times, right? So uh, this slide right here um, is a, a gives us a historical perspective. Um, and I just want to make a couple points about where we are, um, because a lot of times when we talk about immigration to the US, it's with blinders on. Everybody's living in the present, in the now. All of these issues feel like, um, that we hear about in the popular press, and a lot of the kind of contentious issues feel like they're very new. Um, but it's always, I think, useful to go back into our own um, US history and be reminded that immigration um, was a phenomenon in the past. Um, and a lot of these similar issues that we're dealing with today um, came up with that. Um, so uh, just really quickly, in the current wave where we are um, right here, this is a um, Latin American dominated wave of immigration. Okay? It's by far the largest in terms of sheer numbers um, in the history of our country. So nearly 40 million immigrants have come to the US since 1965. About half of those have come from Latin America and the other half um, a quarter from Asia and then the remainder from um, Africa, Middle East, Europe, and Canada. Um, at the time of the first great wave of immigration to our country, um, uh, immigrants from Northern and Western Europe numbered about 14 million. Okay, so just in terms of comparative numbers, we're talking the first great wave, immigrants from Western and Northern um, Europe numbered 14 million, and since 1965 we've welcomed, welcomed over 40 million. Um, and then in the second great wave, so we split, you guys again, probably, have you heard this already from a previous presentation about the three great waves? No, not really. Okay, so, um, so we think about, when you think about the history of US immigration, we usually divide it into three waves. So there's the first great wave, think about immigrants coming from Western and Northern um, Europe, and then the second, uh, so this is up to from about 1850 um, through, um, about 1870. 1880 is when the second great wave of immigration began, and this is mostly immigrants from Southern and East, Eastern Europe. So the national origins of immigrants in the second great wave were different from the first, primarily because they were coming from Eastern and uh, Southern Europe. Um, that great wave numbered about 19 million um, immigrants. And now we're in the third great wave, which is post-1965, again, it's numbered uh, 40 million. So in terms of sheer numbers, um, this is really we're at an unprecedented point in the history of U.S. migration. Okay. But um, if we're talking about as a proportion of the total U.S. population, and that's what this number is, um, so these, these black bars are, are absolute numbers in, in millions. Um, the black bars are as a proportion of the total U.S. population. Right? So the country was a lot smaller in the previous two great waves of migration. So as a proportion of the total U.S. population, um, we are, and this is as of 2000 right now, it's up around, I think, 12.5% um, um, of the total U.S. population was born outside of the U.S. Okay. But this is still lower than these proportions that we had during the second great wave of immigration, when we had almost 15% of the U.S. population was foreign born. So I think that's, that is important to remember that we still haven't, in, in our past, we actually had a larger proportion of the U.S. population was born abroad than is um, currently the case. Um, right now. Um, and this next slide shows these, these absolute numbers uh, where we are right now, right? Yeah, so as of 2009, 12.5% um, of the population is born outside of the U.S. Um, and here we are at, in, in terms of raw numbers. Um, we have 38 uh, million uh, immigrants born uh, outside of the United States. 
Um, there's also a very um, clear, actually, let me just go back one I have a question for you guys about. So in this, um, no, I'll wait for that. We'll talk history in a second. You know what I forgot to ask at the beginning, is there a, this is hooked up to the internet, right? We just had that yeah. in the last presentation, okay. Because I, I did have a, uh, a, a website that I wanted to go to. This is just to talk about the geographic distribution of immigrants um, in the U.S. currently, right? So there's there's always been a very clear geographic patterning to um, immigration in the U.S. So in the first previous two waves, um, right, there was a lot uh, of concentration of immigrants in the Northeast, <coughs> um, to a lesser extent in the in the Midwest. Um, in the current Great Wave of migration, this is the third Great Wave most of the immigrants coming from Latin America and Asia, um, there's been a real shift in the geographic patterning of the foreign-born population, right? And this has, is linked to the, or, the national origins of current immigrants as opposed to in the past. But now they're much um, more heavily represented in the uh, West and the Southwest. Um, here we have um, in Florida. So there are there's six states <coughs> um, as of 2000 that had a population of immigrants that, was, that were over um, one million. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if that makes a difference in the uh, perceptions of the you know existing population. That you know, since this is really the first great wave in the Southwest, the people you know the living there, they're not used to having the immigrants so much. They weren't immigrants, as in say in the Northeast in New York City around there. If they're more open to immigrants because you know many of them were immigrants or they're uh, parents were immigrants, and so it's, you know, I'm just thinking about the debate that goes on in our country, and if part of that is due to the people in the Southwest not being immigrants or descendants of, you know, their parents being immigrants, if they therefore are not as understanding, as empathetic, maybe, and so they have more of a problem with the current wave than people in the Northeast. I, I think that's a great question, and I think that you're the underlying logic is correct in the sense that, you know, where there's a, a history of immigration and people are potentially, you know, closer in their own personal history to their um, uh, immigrant ancestors, that there might be more tolerance for um, immigration. The one kink in that idea, though, in terms of the Southwest, and this is primarily, um, and we'll get to that in a second, a lot of Mexican origin um, population, is that um, kind of descendants of the Mexican population were in the Southwest way before a lot of the um, non-Hispanic white population that currently resides in the Southwest. We can think of the case of Arizona, where there's a lot of these contentious issues. And that, the majority, I think, Arizona is an excellent test case in whether this is kind of, some of these issues are going to, or the way that these issues are playing out potentially could um, start affecting the rest of the country, is a lot of the anti-immigrant uh, residents of Arizona are migrants themselves. And these are retirees and people who moved to um, Arizona or, you know, one generation, um, past that, who, uh, who moved to Arizona for you know, job opportunities, et cetera. So the descendants of immigrants in, this, in these countries, specifically the Mexican origin population, have been in the Southwest a lot longer than some of the more recent residents that are having a big problem with immigration. But I definitely think that um, you know, people's familiarity with immigration, uh, whether that be because they just moved to Arizona themselves or a generation before, um, or in other parts of the country um, where there's beginning to see, um, thinking of the southeast in particular, increase in immigration popula immigrant populations, um, some of these issues become a lot more contentious. <coughs> um, so, right, so there is this geographic pattern. Currently, the states that have, um, uh, six states have more than one million um, immigrants. They're um, California, New York, Florida, Texas, New Jersey, and Illinois. So those are the, um, the major immigrant receiving states, those six states account for 70% of the foreign born population um, in the US, okay? But only 40% of the total US population. So immigrants never have, I mean, they've always been geographically concentrated and that continues, although since um, the 1990 census, there has been a diffusion of immigrants to um, areas that traditionally were <coughs> immigrant receiving um, states. Uh, so. So that's the, uh, I had a couple slides on Ohio, uh, just to show where we are. 
um, I'll come back to that map in a second. So this is um, data from 2009, and it shows, <coughs> you know, we have a foreign-born population of about a half a million. Um, it's 3.7% um, of the population of Ohio's foreign born. And you can contrast that, right, with um, California, where over a quarter of the population of California's foreign born. Um, New York is uh, around a fifth. So uh, again, how these issues play out in these states, like uh, you were just saying, that ha has a lot to do with the history of immigration in these areas and the overall uh, prevalence of immigrants in these um, areas. So um, Ohio's right at 3.7%, uh, which is uh, similar to Iowa, Arkansas. So we do have a pretty low proportion of our population is foreign born, but again, geographically concentrated. Um, Franklin County is one of the big areas, and then within Franklin County, we have residential areas like the west side that has, that hosts more immigrants than other areas. So, um, so that plays into um, kind of how present immigrant issues are in different parts of the city and the state, et cetera. So in terms of the, the region of birth of the foreign born population in Ohio, um, so breaking this a half million down, um, about 50,000 are from Mexico, 136,000, these are people who were born outside of the United States, are coming from South and East Asia, um, smaller numbers from the Caribbean, um, Central America and South America, and then all other um, is, a, is a really large number. So this is kind of a, a garbage pail uh, category. It includes a lot of different national origins, but a big one, right, what big community do we have, immigrant community we have? Team. Somali, right? So we have a large um, number of African immigrants in Columbus um, that aren't uh, separated out. Uh, in, yeah. Um, I'm kind of shocked by the South and East Asian. I mean, I don't see that in our schools. Where are they going to school? Or what, how old are they? Are they coming in older? No, so part of this is related to the, um, that Ohio was a settlement community for refugee groups. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, Cambodian population, a Vietnamese population, and um, where they are living in the city. Who has anybody yeah. have? Yeah, we're, we're seeing going. more on the south side. <coughs> south side. But yeah, west. not overly west, west side, and south west and west side. side. Yeah. Okay. How about the Russian population? There's a very heavy Russian population. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be um, in this group as well. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a Russian immigrant. So I, it's interesting. Franklin County. Uh, Compared to other, I mean, you look in, in the case of California, right? I mean, the real lion's share of their foreign born population is coming from Mexico, over 4 um, million, um, and then another 3 million from South and East Asia. Um, so they, they really, I mean, the numbers are much higher, but we really have a lot of diversity in our foreign born population. So there's not one group that dominates all others. Yes, yeah, so Russian, African, um, Southeast Asian. So I wanted to go back to, uh, let's see. If, they can just open this up in the internet here. So this is a graphic from uh, from the New York Times, and unfortunately, it's using um, census data from uh, 2000. So it's not the most up to date, but I'm sure once the um, census is rolling out, the results from the 2010 census, they'll update it. But it's a really neat map um, that be mainly because you can kind of see this historical. Um, you can see change over time in the geographic concentration of immigrants and different immigrant groups. Is it going? Okay, so let's start back in 1880, and there's two ways to look at this map. Um, um, you can look at it as a percent of the population, so a proportion of the total U.S. population, or you can click here and just look at um, sheer number, and then the sheer number is given by the size of the bubble. <coughs> um, so, you know, larger bubbles equal a, you know, larger population. So just like what, yeah, uh, I don't know your guys' names. Sorry. Um, oh, we have names. You do have names. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the week, you guys are talking about names. Right? Uh, just like a Roger was uh, saying, you know, at the beginning. So this is the This is the beginning of the um, the second Great Wave, right? So the the national origins of this wave of of immigrants were coming from 
um, eastern and southern Europe, right, and heavily concentrated in the northeast of, of the United States. Um, so, um, you know, then we start seeing settlement, right, and this this does track the the patterns of um, native-born Americans as well. Um, start migrating uh, um, westward. Um, 19, so this is, again, the total size of the uh, U.S. population, uh, of the foreign-born population. <laughs> okay. And then, you know, now for the first time, we start seeing um, some significant size bubbles in, in the southwest. Um, okay, so, and then, so a lot of what's going to happen to these bubbles has to do with legislation, restrictive legislation um, that starts being enacted post-19. Um, 20. So uh, we'll do this first, and then we'll look at it as a percent of the population. Okay. So 1940. Um, oh, is this? Oh, I didn't know the mouse worked. That would be easier. Um, so now we're starting to see uh, <coughs> populations of foreign-born. Ten-year increments, and those are major changes in the size of those bubbles. Yeah. Noticeable changes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is 1960, 1970, and so start looking for the, um, the, this color bubble, which is immigrants from Latin America, and um, Asia is orange. Okay. So post 1960, this is the third great wave, is where we start seeing really big increases um, in these size bubbles, right? Again, more in the uh, south and southeastern part of the United uh, States. This is the Illinois, Chicago area. Okay, so let's go back. To 1880, and now look at it as a percent of the population. Okay, <clears throat> so as a percent of the population, remember, um, we haven't achieved, um, in terms of national number, with, at the turn of the last century, immigrant foreign born population was around 15%, and we're currently at 12.5, so we haven't gotten um, there yet. Uh, so <clears throat> and the darker the, each color is for the national origin groups, and the darker it gets is the more. Um, the higher proportion of the total population uh, that's uh, foreign born. Okay. I'm sorry, this is not proportion, this is raw numbers. I'm confusing myself. Um, so we see 1940, and this, so again, this is restrictive legislation uh, uh, that. Okay, and so this is uh, 1960, this period following, you know, there was this really restrictive legislation in 1920, I'll get to that in a second, um, but we start to, this is one of the lowest, um, 1970 is when we have the fewest um, foreign born residents, um, uh, well in terms, in, in this contemporary era, <coughs> certainly the lowest pro as a proportion of the United States. Okay, so now we're starting the third great wave, we start to get these numbers up again, but the national origins, right, have changed. Anyway, so I think that's a, a neat map, it's the, um, New York Times um, put this uh, together, and the, I'm sure they'll be updating it soon with the, the 2010 census. All right, so there's Ohio. Okay, so then, right, the, the change in national origins um, since the 1965 legislation that liberalized legislate, uh, immigration laws to the United States and initiated this third great wave. So right, in 19, right before that legislation, the proportion of immigrants coming from Europe um, was the highest, and we see these other groups um, much lower. And then you want this Latin American uh, bar, you see gets a lot um, larger, as does the bar from Asia. So the national origins of contemporary immigrants are from Latin America and Asia. Now, within that Latin American group, there's one, uh, compared to all the group, there's one na uh, region of origin, country of origin that dwarfs all others, and that's Mexico. So uh, Mexican immigrants make up um, the largest proportion of the foreign-born population. Okay, so currently, well, as in 2000, it shouldn't have changed that much, um, Mexicans account for around 28% of the total foreign-born population. So a little less than a third of the total foreign-born population is Mexican origin. Yeah. yeah um, Cuba. Um, Cuba is considered a refugee. Yes. You know, so why is that included? Um, so there's different there's different 
ways that immigrants enter into the country, right? There's different visas. And one of them is as a refugee or an asylee. Okay? So we still consider them immigrants, um, but it's a type of immigrant would be a refugee or asylee. So that's why they're still considered part of the immigrant population, but as a, um, but their visa status is as a refugee or asylee. Um, so the foreign-born population from Mexico was about six times as large as the next uh, closest uh, country of origin, uh, which, is, which is China. Um, so the Mexican immigrants, they've increased their population size about 15-fold. Okay, so less than a million in 1970 to more than 11 million um, presently. Population's right around 12, 12 million. Um, so that's an annual growth rate of 8% maintained every year um, for over three decades. This is a, um, a large population and a, and a growing population. And it's increasingly important for the demographic future of, of the United States. Um, so the rapid growth of the, the Hispanic or Latino population, and specifically the Mexican um, origin uh, part of that population, is, is due to a combination of demographic factors. Right? The first um, is that the Latino population is significantly younger than the general US population. Um, so there's a larger proportion that are in childbearing age or starting families. Right? They also have higher fertility levels. Um, they're not as astronomically high that a lot of the, uh, the public press makes you think, but it's, um, they, on average, um, an Mexican woman will bear a little less than three, this is in demographic terminology, you have less than three <laughs> children in, in their lifetime, and the average American um, has around two, okay, so they're about one child um, greater. And then the other demographic force driving um, the, the population size of the, of, of the Latino population, right, is immigration. So more immigrants originate in Latin America, specifically Mexico, than um, in any other region. Now, in contrast, the Asian population, the growth um, of the Asian population since 1970 is almost wholly accounted for by immigration. Okay, they don't have um, as high fertility uh, levels, um, so most of the growth of that population is really due to immigration factors, whereas for the Hispanic po population, it's a combination of immigration and, and fertility. Um, Okay, so looking at the breakdown of the Hispanic population, this is um, um, from the 2010 census, so hot off, hot off the press is the right, Mexicans um, are 63% of the Hispanic population. Okay? So they're 30% of the immigrant population, um, but they're 63% of the, whenever we talk about Hispanics or Latinos, um, Mexicans account for 63% of that population. Okay, so the next, the next largest group, um, are Puerto Ricans at 10%, um, all other Hispanics, another garbage pail um, term that includes um, immigrants from Central and South American countries. Um, Cubans make up 3.5% um, of the um, Hispanic population, but again, are very geographically concentrated, right, in Florida and to a lesser extent um, New York, uh, so uh, that's geographically dependent, but we're, at, we're talking about the national level, um, then Salvador. And in terms of growth of the um, Hispanic population since the 2000 census, the, the, the group that had the highest growth rates were Guatemala. Now, growth rates are always somewhat dependent on the size of the initial population, right? So the smaller the initial population, the higher potential for uh, high growth. Um, so that makes a difference, but it's interesting that uh, Central Americans from 2000-2010 census, um, Central Americans, Guatemala, Guatemala and uh, El Salvador, um, had the highest growth rates, right? And Mexicans are down there at 54, um, Cubans at uh, 43. Okay, so everybody always asks whenever you're talking about immigration, well, what about the unauthorized population? So all of the statistics I've given you up to this point have included the unauthorized population as a component of the foreign-born um, population. But how large is the unauthorized population in the U.S.? So this is from um, 2009 data. This gives a breakdown of the region of origin of the unauthorized um, population, um, term that um, scholars prefer in um, contrast to the term illegal. Um, the unauthorized population in the United States is around 12 million currently. It's around 12 million people who are considered immigrants are here um, without proper papers. 
right? Of that 12 million, 60% are from Mexico. 20% are from other Latin American countries. 4% are from Europe and Canada. Another 11% uh, are from Asia, and 4% are from Africa or from other countries. Um, so Mexico does dominate um, the unauthorized population, but um, just over half. Uh, but you know, 40% of the unauthorized population is not from Mexico. So even though Mexicans have taken on the face of the unauthorized population in a lot of the public debates about immigration, um, yeah. Do you know how they determine those numbers? This question came up earlier in the week, and we hadn't had it. Yes, actually, I, so I, I had uh, some other slides that I don't have in here now that, that talks about. So whenever you're coming up with an estimate, right? These are statistical estimates based on survey data. You have a band of confidence around which you can be 99% um, confident that the true population estimate, so the real true number of undocumented in this country, falls within this band. Okay. And so what you do is, you, you, you know, demographers do these surveys, then they use statistical analysis to determine, um, you know, how confident they can be that the true population estimate falls um, around 12 million, right? So the, from this, you know, it's from indirect su survey methodology, right? So you'll, um, it depends on the survey uh, in terms of how they come up with this number. The current population survey um, will ask about your visa status. Um, then they usually augment it with other surveys where you have the indirect estimation, you know the total number of foreign born, you know how many people are here on visas, and then you just do the subtraction and you come up with an estimate for the unauthorized population. So demographers can be, I think it's somewhere between 95 and 99 percent confident um, in coming up with ballpark figures here that the true unauthorized population is somewhere, I think it's between 10 million and 13 million. Okay? So it might be off by a million or so, but it's not, um, it's not that off. Yeah, yes. Yeah. You know, I have a concern, you know, I know when we're crossing the border of uh, Mexico, mm -hmm. there's a large, large population coming from, you know, the whole Central America. Mm -hmm. Is, are they being counted as Mexican or are they counted as each one of the other countries? Like uh, there's a large population coming from, you know, from Colombia, South America. Through Mexico. Mexico. Through Mexico. As, and those are illegal, you know? Yeah, so they're not going to be counted as Mexicans. Even they're passing through Mexico on their way to the United States. And who does it count? They're count oh, th so this is, this is where we come up with, you get these estimates from different national surveys, and then you use kind of statistical methodology to come up with these estimates. Um, and again, you know, these are estimates that you can never be, we're never, we don't have a, you never can be 100% confident in these estimates, right? Because we don't have a hard count of the unauthorized population. But using statistics, you can come pretty close. So we can be 99% confident that, in fact, 20% uh, of the unauthorized population um, is coming from other Latin American countries. Um, and then this is the growth of the unauthorized population um, from 2000 through uh, 20, 2010. Um, and we see, right, it really had kind of exponential growth through the um, 2000s, um, and then a drop off um, kind of corresponding with the economic downturn. So uh, we're seeing kind of, it's not clear what the rest of this trajectory is going to look like as we're emerging from this <coughs> recession. Any other questions on unauthorized population? So last, um, oh, this is important, I think, for you guys as educators, which is that, um, you know, we're not, when we're talking about immigrants, a lot of the time, immigrant issues, we're not just talking about um, individuals who are born outside of the United States. A lot of times we're talking about them and their children who were born here in the United States, right? So the second generation, meaning you were born in the U.S., but at least one of your parents was born outside of the U.S., are becoming increasingly important demographically. Okay, so this graphic shows, this is a projection um, beginning in uh, 1950, but then projecting out to 2050, kind of the proportion of the Latino population by generation status. And first generation is the solid line right here. So currently, as a portion of the total Latino population, it's dominated by immigrants. Okay. But this is not going to be the case. We're going to see a crossover um, starting in, um, you guys can estimate, around um, 2015, 2020, um, the, as a proportion of the total Latino population, immigrants are going to take a back seat, and it's their children who are going to make up the majority of the Latino population. 
So we see this cross over the second um, generation and then uh, corresponding um, increase in the third um, generation. So uh, the steady growth of the second generation is really going to be um, key and there would be this transitional period through the, um, after we, uh, well we're in it right now actually, 2011, starting in, in 2010, where the second generation is going to overtake um, the foreign born population um, as a portion of the, the total Latino or Hispanic population. Um, and this links to a kind of a growing issue uh, in demography, um, which is this idea of a racialized gender gap. And it gets back to when I use this case of Arizona and whether this is going to be kind of what we're, the rest of the country is going to be dealing with um, in the next couple decades. Um, what's happening is that the, uh, as you know, these the second generation is disproportionately concentrated um, in the in younger ages. Okay, so we're starting to see a racialization to the age structure of the United States. So um, this just shows the, the percent of the population age 65 and older projecting out to 2050. So here we are right now, 80% of the population 65 and older is, is 80 80% uh, of the uh, senior population is white. Okay. About 8% is African American, 7% is Hispanic. Um, but, um, you know, so right now, the majority of the senior population is um, not Hispanic or white. <laughs> but we're going to see a growth in the um, under age 20 um, and 20 to 39 age groups are going to be becoming increasingly um, minority um, as a result of children of uh, immigrants and as we. Um, move forward. Okay, so there's going to be a, a growing racial and ethnic divergence between America's elderly population and younger age groups. So there's a growing racial and ethnic diversity of the youth population. Is, there's going to be a lag before it's reflected in the older age groups. It will happen. Okay, Obviously, the second generation is going to age um, themselves, but we're, we're going to be, there will be a middle period that we're starting to enter right now where the senior population in the U.S. is overwhelmingly white and the youth population in the U.S. is no longer majority white. Okay. So 55% of children are not Hispanic white, whereas 80% of the senior population is not Hispanic white. So there's going to be this racialized gender gap. Okay. What that means for a lot of these issues regarding school funding um, and a host of other uh, kind of issues uh, potentially might be what's playing out in Arizona right now. Uh, so what's that? Oh, yeah. This is a common complaint in my classes, actually, that I will flip through the slide. Could you uh, uh, say a little bit more about what you just said about the implication for school? Right. So I'm thinking that, you know, you guys probably know more about this than I do. I'm just thinking about bringing up the Arizona case when you have a lot of voters who are overwhelmingly white, um, and they're disproportionately the ones who are voting in the case of Arizona, and they're voting on school levies or school funding to fund an increasingly minority youth population, um, th there might be some, some conflicts, and I think that's what's happening right now in, in Arizona. And whether that's going to start to become more of a reality for the rest of the United States, when we go through this period where we have this racialized gender gap. Um, so what's happening? <coughs> Excuse me, what's happening in Georgia? Yes, <laughs> yeah, we're getting a lot of these kind of very restrictive, a lot of res restrictive legislation, not just around education, but also other social services and around immigration in general. Um, and some of this is because of, of this of this racialized gender gap, uh, uh, sorry, racialized age gap, and the fact that older people are much more likely to vote. Um, and not only does this go hand in hand uh, with uh, racial diversity, but the proportion of, of people living in poverty. Um, so, you know, we have a real decrease in the number of seniors that are living in poverty, good thing, um, but an increase in children who are living in poverty. So again, for funding for social services, et cetera, kind of what that means, we'll, I think we'll be hearing a lot more about this. That's my last um, slide on, so that's my, chance to hold forth on demographic trends. Uh, any questions before we I switch gears and start talking about health? Yeah. I have a 
question that's just been alluded to, and I've, I've been thinking about it all, all week, and we kind of touched one in that direction just now. We have restrictive legislation in Arizona. We've got it in Georgia now. I know that there's a movement in Ohio in that direction. How likely are we to see that kind of legislation proposed here in Ohio? Oh, it has been. I mean, they've had House bills, very restrictive House bills that have come up um, that haven't been voted in. But you know, now we're looking at a Republican governor, uh, Republican House and Republican State Senate that um, I think it makes it more of a, a potential. The real question is how much more um, the federal government is going to allow states to craft their own um, state level immigration. So that's kind of the big question. Obama, in May, um, he gave a, a speech in Arizona. I don't know if anybody saw it. He had all the American flags behind him. And he gave a speech that said that immigration legislation is kind of at the top of his agenda. Um, but now, you know, the budget um, is kind of uh, surpassed that in terms of it being in the news. So whether he'll be effective at crafting a fe federal legislation, um, which would kind of subsume a lot of the state level, or but if, but if there's a vacuum right now and the federal government doesn't step in, I think we'll, we will see much more <coughs> um, uh, conservative, at least legislation at the state level. For, um, but you know, like it, the, but the legislation that just passed in Georgia is getting held up in the courts. So you know, at the state level, there's a lot of, and that might kind of bring the issue eventually to the federal government. Um, yeah, but we'll be hearing more about. <laughs> this kind of, I think, reactionary state-level legislation in the next uh, year. Okay, immigrant health. So, um, despite this, uh, the increasing demographic relevance of immigrants um, to the U.S. post-1965, there's been a lot. There hasn't been a lot of research dedicated to immigrant um, health, um, but there has been increasing attention to. Um, that's odd. I didn't know realize it. Okay, this is a slide I got from the CDC. I didn't know they had it set up for the stuff to pop out. Um, but to health disparities, okay? So racial health disparities that I, are the idea that different racial groups have different health profiles. And particularly, many racial minority groups have worse health profiles than um, non-Hispanic whites. Okay, so there's a lot of attention um, to um, these, what we call racial health disparities and trying to eliminate them um, as we, uh, move forward. So part of when we talk about racial health minorities, we're talking about the Hispanic or the Latino population. So I want to talk about the health of the Latino <coughs> population, but I want to first talk about the health of the immigrant population because, again, they're so closely tied. Right now, the majority of the Latino population is foreign born. <coughs> okay, so when we're talking about the health of immigrants in the United States, there's actually a paradoxical, paradoxical pattern, and it's called the epidemiologic paradox. And this is the idea that the health outcomes, um, well, there's two components to the paradox. One is when we compare oops, health outcomes of the um, immigrants, so whenever I say foreign born, right, I'm referring to immigrants, versus um, the native born within that particular race ethnic group. So this would be within the Latino um, race ethnic group, how does the health of immigrants compare to those Latinos who were born here in the United States? And then there's this issue of just looking at the health outcomes of, of different race ethnic groups. So comparing the health outcome of Latinos or Mexicans to whites or African Americans. <coughs> okay. So there's two different types of comparison here. This intra-group comparison. Um, so we're looking within the Latino population and comparing foreign born to native born. And then inter-group comparisons where we compare um, the health of Mexicans to the whites, for example. <coughs> so let's talk about the patterns that make up these two types of comparisons. So the first one is when we're looking at intra-group variation. <coughs> okay. So we're looking within a race ethnic group, how does the immigrant population compare um, to the native born? Um, and the general trend is that immigrants have better health than their native born counterparts. Okay. So we're looking at the non-Hispanic white population, Non-Hispanic whites who were born outside the United States have better health profiles than non-Hispanic whites who were born in the United States. This is for virtually every immigrant group um, in the country, the exception in some cases being refugees. Um, but 
if you think about the, uh, the uh, black population in the United States, if we look at black African Americans who were born, well, black immigrants, right? Even my terminology is mixed up a little bit. But black immigrants who were born um, outside the US and are here, and we compare them to native born black, they have better health than native born black. Um, if we look at Asian, uh, Chinese individuals who were born in the United States have worse health than Chinese um, immigrants who came to the United States. Okay, so that's one pattern that's part of the, the paradox. So, so the question is why, yeah? Right. Oh, I'll stop this. Okay, I'm going to talk Sorry, a little bit about compar <laughs> another comparison and then we'll get to why. Okay. okay. So the next thing, so that's intra-group comparisons. What about inter-group comparisons? So if we're looking at different race ethnic groups, one of the trends that pops out is that Hispanics often have health outcomes that are comparable to the health status of the majority population, which right now is non-Latino whites, despite higher levels of socioeconomic disadvantage. Okay. So this is a paradox. How come uh, Hispanics who are often um, less advantaged than the majority population have better health? So there's two parts of, of, the, of the paradox. Okay. And this next set of slides will just go through some of these uh, trends in Hispanic um, health. And these slides are coming from the um, CDC. So this is a uh, this is the oh um, this is just the total population okay so a refresher of what we um, talked about right that the Hispanic Latino population right now um, is uh, 15 um, percent it's going to double by 2050 to 30 percent so this is, the health of this population is going to be increasingly relevant to uh, healthcare provisions and kind of the health of the, the country as a whole so this is looking at infant mortality so this is infant death under one year per 1,000 live births. Um, so the infant mortality rate for the entire United States is at 6.9. This is the highest out of all um, developed nations in the world. Not, a, uh, not something to be proud of. Um, largely driven by the high rate of infant mortality um, uh, of African Americans. Um, but then the infant mortality rates of um, whites uh, and Hispanics are also higher than what we see in other um, industrialized countries. The important thing to note here, though, in terms of talking about intergroup uh, comparisons, that the Hispanic rate is very similar to the non-Hispanic white rate. And this is important because, you know, one of the ways that uh, we understand the high rates of mortality with the African-American population is because of um, poverty and low socioeconomic status. Um, but the Hispanic population also has very high rates of poverty. It does not have um, the same high infant death rate. Paradox. Okay. Uh, this is uh, this is breaking out the Hispanic population. Um, so we see um, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban. So Puerto Ricans have uh, much higher infant mortality rates. Uh, Mexicans, who again make up the majority of the Hispanic population, uh, so that's really driving uh, this low uh, rate. Uh, but Cubans um, have even lower infant mortality than non-Hispanic whites. Again, infant mortality is very important because this is an indicator that um, demographers and social scientists use as kind of an indicator of how well a society takes care of its most vulnerable members, right? Infant mortality rates should not, um, should not differ across groups and they should be low for the country as a whole. So the extent that there are differences, the extent that it's higher than other industrialized countries is a real cause for concern. Yeah. Uh, could you uh, say a little more about those two highest bars, African-American, non-Hispanic, and then African-American? Yeah, so they're not that different. This is the big difference in the, um, the most recent censuses is that, um, well, no, that's the big difference is you can choose multiple, multiple racial groups. But starting in, I think it was 1980, right, we have um, an ethnicity question and a race question. So people are asked what racial group that you belong to and the choices are white, black, Native American, Asian, other, um, the other is a, a new one. And then they're asked, what, ethnic, are you, what ethnicity are you, Hispanic or Latino? Okay. So when demographers are putting together these numbers, anybody who marked um, African American, they put in this category. right? Um, but then they also, uh, same for white, anybody who marked white, they put in this category. But then they also uh, take out of that white category anybody who's marked Hispanic. And that's where we get this group, non-Hispanic white. So these are not mutually exclusive. This white category just includes people who also marked Hispanic. Oh, so you could be in two groups. Right? Yeah, and this white category is more, um, it's a broader uh, category. So to be very clear, it's particularly important, it doesn't, 
well, in this case, there is a difference, but in terms of numbers, there are not as many um, Hispanics who will mark that they're black, but there certainly are, especially among Puerto Ricans and Haitians, that's a, that's a component. But there's a lot of Hispanics who mark white. So if we want to really be distinct and we want to talk about the Latino population, we talk about the Latino population regardless of what race they marked. And then we talk about the white population, only white people who did not mark that they're Hispanic. Similar for the black population, we talk about only black population that did not mark Hispanic. So we talk about non-Hispanic blacks, non-Hispanic whites, and Hispanics. Okay, so that's, what about maternal more? Mortality, again, you know, not, um, not good, but we have Hispanic rates that are lower than non-Hispanic white rates. Um, this is all-cause mortality uh, per 100,000 um, persons, and we see the all-cause um, mortality for Hispanics. This is age-adjusted, okay? So yes, the Hispanic population is younger, but this is age-adjusted death rates, lower uh, mortality than um, the white population in spite of higher rates of, of poverty. Um, this is an injury uh, category, so now we're going by cause of, of death. Um, and in this case, American Indians have the, uh, Native Americans have the highest um, motor vehicle related uh, injuries, but when we're talking about the paradox, we see Hispanics have lower than um, white, um, HIV, uh, much lower, oh, I'm sorry, higher than um, whites, but much lower than African-Americans. Um, um, suicide, again, if you notice, the African-American bar has been very high in a lot of these um, categories, uh, but African-Americans have lower suicide rates than, um, than whites. But Hispanics have lower than um, both groups. Homicide um, is, in this case, higher than, um, than whites. Um, diabetes is higher than whites, so there are um, some specific cause of death uh, categories where Hispanics have higher mortality, diabetes being one, homicide um, being another, uh, cirrhosis of the liver uh, being a third, um, and um, interestingly this is one of the few uh, uh, cause of, uh, this is um, incidence of, of tuberculosis, so this is not, a, uh, this is not a, a cause of death, but this is one of the few um, health outcomes where Asians have the highest. Okay, so the, yeah. As far as the budget is concerned, you know, is it very close related? Uh, as far as the numbers, uh, the statistic, you know, how much money are we allowed to receive for help? You know, I'm just I, I the correlation. Oh, you're making the yeah. I'm just trying to make any correlation between you know the federal government yeah. allocating specific specific amount of money. A specific group of people, you know, based on the bars. Yeah, well, this is one of the, you know, so these are health, just racial health disparities, and, and the federal government has been on, has been very clear for the last uh, couple decades that they want to eliminate racial health disparities, and they put a lot of money towards uh, research dollars to understand some of these causes. Uh, but, you know, no surprise, I feel like this is for the whole, my whole discipline of sociology, you know, anybody on the street can say, I know why there are these disparities, right? The big differences in socioeconomic status and availability of health care, and that's where we need to concentrate our efforts. But those are big societal problems that a lot of people don't want to tackle. Yeah? Uh, I mean, I'm not super familiar with tuberculosis. I know we can get vaccinations and stuff here. Why is it that in, in Asia, is that more like India? Or are we talking like Southern Asia? Or, you know what I mean? Why is that still kind of common? Because here, you don't really hear about people getting tuberculosis. <coughs> right. I don't. Right. I mean, is it, and then why is it? Why is it we, so high in Asia? Yeah, and why is it that here we never, but then they're coming sometimes and they'll be dormant, I guess. You know what I mean? Like, and how's that work as far as if they've been exposed? But yeah. Well, let me say I have I have no idea. I know ter tuberculosis is a tough kind of a immune disease. I have a sister that's a physician that works in a TB clinic, so I probably should know more about how to answer that question. I know it. You know, tuberculosis was much more prevalent in the past, right? I mean, I had a grandfather that um, essentially died from it. So um, it, it's something that the U.S. has successfully, uh, in terms of public health efforts, gotten a handle on. Um, and that's not the case in Asia, but that, I, mean, I can't speak much more. So 
to why. Yeah, but it is one of the few health outcomes where Asians look worse than any of the other race of me. Um, groups. Okay, so now we get to the, the whys. And the first two explanations I don't want to spend too much time on. It's the third one that I, and again, what we're trying to understand is why Hispanics have um, such good health outcomes, um, considering uh, they have higher levels of poverty than when we're making a com comparison to whites. Um, and then the other intergroup comparison, I mean, sorry, intragroup comparison is looking at immigrants, Hispanic immigrants compared to the Hispanic native born. Okay, so the first of this has helped selection hypothesis, right? That migration is not a random process, that it's, you know, you have to have like a kind of, you have to be at a certain level to be able to undertake a migratory act, right? To get up and move yourself or your entire household across a national border. So that weeds out a lot of people who are not healthy enough to do that. So this is in particular when we're talking about comparisons, why immigrants look so healthy compared to their native born counterparts. Um, one hypothesis, right, is it's just the selective migration of healthier, more advantaged um, individuals. Okay. And um, this hypothesis is actually very difficult to test because to do so um, appropriately, you really need uh, representative samples of um, non-migrants from an original, from a sending area, people who migrated are in the U.S. and the people who returned. And to get nationally representative samples of those three populations is very difficult. You know, and, 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 have information on their health, yeah. I was just gonna bring up that in thinking about the health of individuals, it, it's, I think a lot of times we tend to assume, you know, healthcare, we think of healthcare, you know, going to the doctor and uh, accessibility of hospitals and so forth. But that's that's really a, a small part of it. You know, when thinking about these things, we have to think of lifestyle. You know, their eating habits, the nutrition, smoking, um, because ultimately that's that's a, the larger part of uh, the health of a lot, a lot of individuals is you know just their general lifestyle and the exercise they get you know and things like well, that. Well I'll go one step further and I'd say you know because a lot of times when we think about a health outcome and differences in health outcomes between groups we think we have a framework it's called approximate determinant framework so it's kind of these factors that determine your health which ones are the closest to determining kind of your health. And you mentioned healthcare is like right up, you know, when you have a problem. So access to healthcare when you have a health problem and how that affects your health. But prior to that is what, you know, why do people have health problems in the first place? And you're suggesting lifestyle factors, diet, exercise, and we'll get to that in a second. But prior to that, I mean, there are also what um, two epidemiologists um, from Columbia have called fundamental causes of health. So what influences an individual's lifestyle, habits, healthy eating, and their argument is going one step back. It has to do with your socioeconomic status and your poverty status. Do you have access to grocery stores? Can you buy fresh fruits and vegetables that determine whether you have a healthy diet? So there's this whole stream, they call them upstream factors that are really close to a health outcome, and then downstream factors that are much more distal, but very important. So their argument is you can switch out some of these more, um, more proximate causes, for example, smoking rates have decreased considerably in the United States. So death due to smoking um, or lung-related causes is, is definitely <coughs> on the decline, you know, as fewer um, proportions of the incoming cohorts are smoked, or more recent cohorts are smoking. Right? But it's taken on, so we've changed that health habit. But smoking in the United States is increasingly becoming tied, now that it's not so dispersed in the general population, um, to your socioeconomic status. So there's much higher rates of smoking among the poor in the United States. So even though we think, you know, there's no longer a close tie between smoking and cause of death, or it's not a, it's not one of the main causes, of, it's not going to be one of the main causes of death. Uh, we're still gonna see disproportionate deaths um, among poor individuals for smoking. So they say, uh, you know, to really address these differences between these groups, we need to un address these fundamental causes in terms of why um, certain groups are um, much more, much harder societal questions. Why do we have such inequality in, in this country? Um, a lot you know, difficult uh, issues. But I'll get to the culture, uh, that, hy those, that hypothesis in a second. So I, one of the reasons, right, that immigrants uh, look healthier and Hispanics look healthier is because of this <coughs> selection hypothesis. Um, the next hypothesis is that it's simply a data artifact, right? that when we're looking at adult mortality, those slides that I uh, just showed you, that when, you, when an immigrant gets sick, 
they're like, more likely to go back to their home country where they have friends and family and a supportive safety net, um, and they'll die there. So their death doesn't get included in the, um, the numerator of deaths in the United States. Okay? So the out-migration of sick individuals. So it's not that immigrants are healthier. It's just that the sick ones leave. So it, they look healthier than they really are, the data artifact. Um, in the case of infant mortality, the idea is that, again, if you have a sick infant, then you're more inclined to um, migrate back to your home country um, than stay uh, in the United States. But there's been um, research that has refuted this idea that it's simply a, a data artifact. Right? And um, so this is, uh, this is an article that was in one of the leading demo demographic journals a couple years ago by my advisor uh, from graduate school. And they looked at um, essentially the infant mortality rates of uh, immigrants versus the US born uh, in all these periods after uh, a birth. And basically, I don't want to go through the whole table, um, the, the upshot of this analysis is that something like 50,000 women with sick infants would have to migrate back to Mexico directly after a birth for this really to be a data artifact. That in fact, the infant mortality rate, the low infant mortality rates that we see among the Hispanic population, particularly the Mexican origin population, is not a data artifact. Okay? Their kids really are less likely um, to die in their first year of life. So the data artifact, uh, Hypothesis, um, whereas the selection hypothesis, personally, I think, um, does play a role in the, these healthy uh, profiles. Um, the data artifact hypothesis, I think, is much less uh, relevant. Third hypothesis is the cultural hypothesis, right? That immigrants have lower stress, they have healthy behaviors, uh, what Roger was just getting at. Um, they have high levels of family cohesion and social support, and all of these things help buffer them from the poverty that they experience in the United States. So it helps them, um, it, helps, it helps immigrants uh, remain healthier than they would normally be um, given their uh, low levels of um, socioeconomic status. Um, let's talk about this. Okay. Before I talk about that, I just I don't have this slide, but this I, this idea that it's really kind of um, culture uh, that's driving these differences between immigrants and their native-born counterparts within race ethnic groups has um, received empirical support in the literature. Right, but it looks like kind of the strength of this cultural hypothesis depends on the immigrant group that you're looking at. So, for example, um, this foreign-born advantage that immigrants do better than their native-born counterparts are, is strongest in the cases of um, blacks, um, Filipinos, and Mexican-Americans. Okay, so those three groups have this, the, strong, the largest differences between immigrants and their native-born counterparts. Um, and uh, in the case of Filipinos, this foreign-born advantage is almost completely um, explained by socioeconomic factors, right? Immigrants are more advantaged in their socioeconomic profiles than native-born Filipinos. So once we account for the fact that immigrants have, current immigrants from the Philippines uh, have, are wealthier than Filipinos who are born in the United States, that explains why um, the immigrants do that. Right? That's not the case for Mexicans. Once we even account, once we account for the fact that immigrants might be poor, then um, in the case of Mexicans, native-born um, <coughs> Mexicans, they still have a health advantage. Okay? So for Mexicans, some of these other factors are probably more relevant. Um, interesting, in the case of Mexicans, smoking played a really big role in some of it. This is um, looking at uh, um, adult mortality, um, different rates of smoking between Mexican immigrants and um, native-born Mexicans explained. Um, the foreign-born, um, some of that foreign-born advantage. So it's, um, Can you go over that again? I for, the, for all the different groups or just Mexicans? Just Mexicans. So in the case of Mexicans, once we accounted for the fact that there's different rates of smoking among immigrants and the native-born, native-born Mexicans are much more likely to smoke, that accounted for um, a good part of the um, foreign-born advantage, the reason that the immigrants among Mexicans have lower mortality rates. Some of that's, good part of that's tied to smoking. Okay. 
for adult mortality. Well, what's interesting is that uh, some of the speakers before have sort of referred to the fact that there's high incidences of uh, diabetes in some of the, uh, what would you call the smaller areas in Mexico, the, is it the rancheros? <coughs> Oh, you mean like rural areas? In rural areas. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll get to that in a second. Okay. Diabetes is one of these outliers, and it's one of the few health outcomes that once in the United States that the Hispanic population has higher rates. Um, it's a real uh, issue for the, the Hispanic community, or these high rates of diabetes. We'll get to that in a second about okay. why, and back in Mexico, why there might be variability for in rural areas. Okay, so the next question, and part of this epidemiological paradox that I haven't talked about yet, is that even though immigrants look, have better health profiles than their native born counterparts, um, the more time they spend in the US, the worse um, their health gets. And so it's a very um, a negative US effect, basically. Yeah, you know, terrible things to <laughs> yeah. yeah. So are you guys familiar with that? I've seen at the health food store, like, you know, they tell me, I've been here for six months, all of a sudden, you know, now I'm sick, my blood pressure is up, I have this and that, and they're trying to, you know, find something to, you know, make themselves get healthier. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's once they get here. So some of these, <laughs> some of these factors, that, you know, if this is the reason that immigrants do better, then these factors, once they're in the U.S., change potentially for the worse. Um, okay. So this is a slide. This is looking again at. Uh, sorry, I know infant mortality is like a really sad topic, and I don't want to keep bringing it up, but it's, it's an area that I studied quite a bit, looking at these differences. And again, I think it's really important from a societal viewpoint because it's our ability to take care of our most vulnerable um, citizens. So if we look at differences, this is in the case of Puerto Rican um, infants um, in terms of their risk of, of dying in the first year of life. We see this, look at this, just look at these black bars here. This is the more time that um, the moms have spent in the U.S., the higher the risk that their infant will die in the first year of life. So it really goes up, you know, every five years. Um, so women, Puerto Rican women who've been here for um, more than 20 years, their infants have the highest, um, highest risk of death. Yeah. What causes infant mortality? What are the like, the main cause? Yeah. So um, there's two types of mortality that we study. So you kind of split infant mortality into neonatal mortality and postneonatal mortality. Neonatal mortality is when the infant dies within the first month, so the first 28 days of life, and those tend to be due to congenital anomalies. So problems that the infant was born with that were present at birth. Okay. Um, and this is obviously linked to the health of the mom. Those tend to be you know, very highly linked to the health of the mom. After the first month, um, we call it postneonatal mortality. And those infant deaths tend to be more closely tied to um, life conditions. Um, so. so like, for example, uh, in the neonatal, uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that used to be common, well, that I've heard of is that a lot of African American mothers may smoke, or poor pe people that live in poverty have a tendency to smoke more during their pregnancy and actually consume alcohol as well. So sometimes those things can affect the neonatal. Yeah, <coughs> smoking is part of the story. Alcohol, in terms of racial disparities, I, actually, I don't think that there's evidence for that. But another um, kind of really um, interesting line of research that has to do with stress. So the potential that you know stress due to um, living in poverty, racism, et cetera, that that actually because the the again we're talking about proximate determinants, but the the most significant predictor of infant death is premature birth, right? So if the baby is born early, and prematurity has been linked to high levels of stress and different hormones that your body um, produces when you have the high levels of stress. So this is a real kind of emerging line of research. Um, that's looking at maybe that's one of the main reasons that African American women have such high levels of um, infant mortality has to do with um, stress and, and related uh, to poverty. Um, but again, Hispanic women with similar rates of poverty seem to avoid some of these um, issues. This is part of the paradox um, getting to these potential um, healthy behaviors, support, um, and lower stress that, uh, that they experience. But again, this protection starts to erode with time in the U.S. And um, some of this is that immigrants become racialized as U.S. minorities and have to deal with a lot of the same uh, uh, negative uh, life uh, conditions that minorities in the U.S. have to, uh, to deal with. Okay? So again, this idea that maybe there's an erosion of protection offered by the country of origin over time, 
and some of these um, issues related to minority health become more salient for um, Hispanics with time in the U.S. and then across generations. Um, we know that uh, immigrants in general with more time in the U.S. have higher levels of obesity, higher levels of hypertension, higher levels of other uh, chronic conditions. Um, and now I wanted to talk a little bit about a case study from a, um, a professor uh, at Rutgers University um, who I've never met but who shared this study with me and I'm sharing it uh, with you. Although, in terms of putting it online, I didn't ask him if I could share this, so we'll have to, maybe I can send him an email and just make sure that it's okay. Um, so this is a study that he did looking at, it was a case study um, looking at the diets. <coughs> this is getting right back to one of these factors, um, potentially um, getting the, right, these healthy behaviors, um, why immigrants have this advantage, in particular looking now at the case of Mexico. So he's looking at diets among Oaxacan immigrants who are in New Jersey and then also um, their diet back in, in Oaxaca. So he wants to compare dietary practices and to understand processes of dietary change and to identify <coughs> food ways and food preferences among Oaxacans once they get to the United States and how those differ from um, what they did when they were in um, Oaxaca. And then the idea, right, is to propose some interventions um, to try to prevent their diets from worsening once they're uh, here in the U.S. Okay. So it talks to 23 um, immigrants in New Brunswick and 32 um, non-migrants in Oaxaca. Um, and he, uh, these are just some of the characteristics of the sample. And so he says, you know, what's going on in, um, in Oaxaca compared to New Brunswick? Okay, so these are some quotes. Um, this first one, they, they're saying, <coughs> the migrants are saying that in, the, in Mexico, it's very difficult to buy meat, okay? It's very expensive. Um, here they say the bone that, he, that here, this is from the Oaxacan perspective, they, um, I'm sorry, in the U.S., the bone that they sell for dogs in the U.S. is very expensive in Oaxaca, okay? Um, so there, this idea that diets are very, you know, this gets to regional diversity, uh, within the, the sending country, that there are different diet practices in different regions. Um, they still see these in um, New Brunswick. Um, but one of the big differences, right, are these uh, producers of, of these, this is the backdrop I've been using this whole time, right, these fresh fruits and vegetables um, are in Mexico, and in the U.S. we're just purchasing these fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, um, and then, so the rural communities, they produce these in Oaxaca. Um, I'm not sure where that slide is going. Okay, tortillas are a staple of the Oaxacan and Mexican diet in general, right? So this, this idea that a meal is not a meal without tortillas. Um, and, you know, in Mexico, they're made fresh by hand from corn in the U.S., right? Um, you make it from a bag. Um, but <coughs> in Mexico, it's rare. I don't know about this actually. My experience in Mexico has not been that case. I think increasingly people buy tortillas, but they buy them fresh from the person that's making them down the street. Um, beans are also a key food in Oaxacan diets, right? So there's a wide variety of meats available in Mexican markets. Have you guys gone to one of the Mexican grocery stores, part of this? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, okay, so you guys saw all the, all the different types of beans, right? Um, so in New Brunswick, there's also a lot of um, beans available. Once you switch over though into candy cooked beans, you know, you get a lot more, um, can beans, you get a lot more sodium, but so kind of brings down some of the nutritional benefits. Um, anyway, the idea that beans are very important, right? Fresh fruits and vegetables, tortillas are all very important. A big difference is, is meat, though, okay? So in meat, me, meat in Mexico is rare, okay? They eat one to two times a week. Uh, more often they eat chicken rather than beef, um, and they eat a lot more eggs. Um, animals in Mexico are forms of saving. Right, so um, especially we're talking about in rural areas, um, they're not um, free about kind of meat producing. In the U.S., Oaxacans are proud to be able to eat meat several times a week. So this is kind of an indication that they've made it. You know, they come to the United States and they can afford to eat something that's very special um, back in Oaxaca. Right, so it's a sign of economic improvement. And at least for men, you know, this this idea that you can eat as much meat as you want is really um, kind of a sign that you've made it. Um, but. Right, it's also a sign that you're going to be looking at increased rates of obesity. Um, so, quotes about eating meat. 
right? She's, the interviewer says, well, you said in New Jersey you usually meet every day. Is it the same in Oaxaca? And she said, yeah, here we eat it every day, but there it's very difficult to buy meat because it's very um, expensive. And this is a table um, from an analysis that I did with a colleague at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and we looked at, this is for all immigrants, okay, so now we're moving away from the Mexican case, but what happens once immigrants come here to the United States? Um, you know, are they, do they say that, do they report that they've changed their diets? Do they say that they're eating more meat or more junk food? And indeed, we see with these, with these positive significant numbers, we don't have to know what they mean, but the, the direction is that the more time you spend in the U.S., the more likely you're, you are to change your diet when you get here, the more likely you are to eat more meat, and the more likely you are to eat more junk food. This is true for men and women and um, for all immigrant groups. And you break it down, this more meat um, effect is really pronounced in the case of Mexican immigrants. Okay. So there's no question. Yeah? Like, I know a lot of the kids will eat a ton of candy, different suckers, things like that. I mean, is that all? I know here maybe they have more money to buy that sort of stuff. Is it really because they buy it from like the Mitchell Cano or yeah. is it stuff that's sold? Yeah. In Mexico, or is it something they started making here? Or no, my, exp my experience in the, being, like I did some research in a small town in Mexico, is that after school, you know, there's a little kind of hand, um, you know, somebody who has a cart, and they just kind of roll up. And yeah, there's all different kinds of candies that the kids buy, um, but in very small quantities. You know, money is a lot scarcer, so they, they might buy one lollipop way. instead of two candy bars. Um, OK, so this gets here, right? In their study, they started looking at children, right? So these are the second generation. These are children of immigrants. Um, and there's this you know, divergence that they're not eating these typical Mexican foods, right? Um, they haven't been introduced to chilies. Um, uh, his children prefer more American diets, which is completely understandable, right? This is the kind of the age-old process of assimilation that they, um, you know, they are Americans, and they're going to eat more American diets. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, these tend to be less nutritious. Right. Also, you know, in a lot of these immigrant families, both of their parents are working um, when they're in the United States, so women do not have as much time to cook. Um, so, the, and then this big one, right, is this greater availability of junk food. So it's not that junk food doesn't exist in Mexico, and it's certainly becoming more and more prevalent, um, but, but in terms of comparisons, it's still much more available and a lot cheaper here in the United States. So this idea of an Americanizing Mexican taste, um, this is a quote um, coming from 1981, kind of the, the classic example. We begin with eating hamburgers, pies, donuts, hot dogs, milkshakes, ice cream, margarine, peanut butter, Coca-Cola replaces the fresh waters made of Jamaica, chia, I don't know what that is, um, and lime. The taste of Mexicans um, has to be whitened. Um, so this is some of these researchers' recommendations <coughs> from their research for nutrition education. Or, I'm sorry, this is a couple more conclusions, but I think this is a really important point here. They're not, I'm sorry, there's not lack of knowledge in terms of um, what's healthy um, and, and what's not healthy, but the major limit is economics, right? So um, there's a lack of, um, you know, they're in a city with high cost and low quality, and this gets back to a lot of the issues that are facing racial minority groups in the U.S., not just immigrants, um, that uh, a lot of the, uh, availability of fresh fruits and vegetables is very restricted in um, a lot of communities in the United States um, compared to what it's like back in uh, Mexico, particularly in, in rural communities. But even in urban areas, the rural producers are so close, there's just a much, it's much easier to buy fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables and make that a part of your, um, your regular diet, okay? And this is not the case in a lot of the cities um, or even rural areas in the, in the United States. Um, so again, I think it's important to not lay the blame on um, individuals in terms of they get here and they don't know that this is, you know, that's bad to not have as many fruit, fresh fruits and vegetables in your diet, um, but they're just not able to, um, to make it happen. Yeah? Could, this, could the changing dynamic, when we're talking about kids, but the changing dynamic of families here in the United States, you know, parents are working a lot and they're not there to make the proper meals or they do what's quick at night that sort of thing, could that also play, in, play into the differences in, in their diet and how that's changed? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, then, if you're thinking about that, that's kind of for the general U.S. population, too, it's becoming more relevant, right, when you have these dual change. Change. I don't think, the, I mean, families don't sit around a dinner table very often anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know about how many of your students actually participate in that. 
I think it's just a general cultural difference across the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do schools perpetuate this? Because I know, you know, we're all teachers in Columbus, and I do the breakfast program at my school, and the stuff that the government calls healthy and whatnot is, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it's amazing. They get a processed burrito with egg and sausage, or sugar cereal, or chocolate milk, or regular milk. And that's just breakfast. And then at lunchtime, it's all heated or fried. Or I mean, I don't think we are doing much service to anyone in society when we say we're trying to make our school lunches healthier or whatever, because they aren't. And they take away gym, like gym classes, like not enough. No. <laughs> physical education, and yeah. I was gonna say, you know, it's it's really a cultural problem because you look. You, know, you look at the epidemic of obesity in the U.S. You know, yeah, it's, it's you know, and the poor certainly have it a lot more difficult. I think you know, I go to the grocery store, I can get the white bread for ninety-nine cents, or if I want to get the you know good whole wheat, you know, no sugar and a healthy bread, that's going to cost me four or five bucks. Nice. And you know, and I'm not that poor, but still, you know, I can't afford to always be buying the natural, you know, healthiest stuff, it's just too expensive. And, and so to me, that's a lot of the cultural problem we have is the healthy stuff is expensive. And, you know, if you're poor, even if you understand the nutrition, you, you just can't, you know, and if you're urban, you can't grow much of your own food, you know, so you're, you're stuck with buying the cheap no, We tried to solve food. this by adding a salad bar. That's oh, great. Yeah, they did. And then the stuff that they put on the salad. It's not nutrition. Right. Branches of food groups. Well, I do think, I mean, you guys know more about this than I do. I think it's trading in the right direction. I mean, I remember in the 80s when President Reagan tried to make ketchup in the ketchup packets count as one of the, one of the vegetables, right? Yeah, he did. I mean, there was a lot of uh, negative publicity around that. So I think, I mean, and now we have Michelle Obama who's made, made that her, you know, one of her main projects in the White houses exercise and healthy eating and stuff so I think I mean and I just hear on the news that aren't there some pushes to try to make school lunches yes. healthier yeah, they added the, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the, the kids are choosing yeah right. eat the and I think they and did stop frying yeah. uh, because I used to do lunch duty and stuff <coughs> like I was the one who would fry the food oh so you saw so it first <laughs> yeah. You, yeah I have yes, thinking about it. You know, um, <laughs> President Obama you know I've been trying to a different, you know, uh, health program, and I just wonder how is that affecting, you know, the immigrants? You know, how will that affect the immigrants with the health program that you know, President Obama wants to, yeah. you know, to build? I can say I was going to mention this too. Maybe linked to that is that a study done by one of the uh, one of my colleagues in the sociology department here looked at weight gain, um, and he compared students in terms of their weight gain over the summer versus during the school year, and in fact. Um, even though schools are probably doing a really bad job, kids gain more weight over the summer when they're at home and, you know, some of these issues that we talked about before where they, you know, the dual earners in the family and they're not allowed to cook these meals. So even schools are providing some level of protection, believe it or not. Um, it actually works when the kids are at home and, you know, a lot of these other issues um, are. So I think, you know, the president is, in the First Lady are right, making this a, a part of their um, their the focus that they, while they're in the White House. But I'm just trying to see officially is that already established that's going to be, you know, President Obama health program. Is that officially approved? Oh, you mean his his uh, health care reform? Reform, right. Yes. How that will affect the immigrants? Well, how is that being oh, the immigrants? Oh, that's a good question. <coughs> Actually, that's an excellent question because that's, they were largely left out that legislation, that was a concession that he had to make. Um, so, uh, and we'll see that, again, that'll be a more of a local issue is how some of these states and different cities step up to provide for their uh, underserved, yeah. Yeah, uh, as <coughs> most of you know, I'm a high school science teacher. And one thing that frustrates me is nutrition is not in the high school science curriculum. Um, there's, I, I'm very frustrated with the science curriculum because there's a lot of very practically important stuff like that that's not in the curriculum, you know. You know, I love teaching about the periodic table and Newton's laws of motion and all that, but, you know, something as fundamental as knowing, you know, how to eat correctly, that's not in the curriculum. 
and I, I would appreciate if you put pressure on your you know, <laughs> leaders to change the curriculum because you know, we shouldn't assume that uh, kids come away from school really understanding nutrition. Yeah, There's no well. health in middle school anymore either. Yeah, yeah they pulled it out. It is in elementary, though. Nutrition. Not, no, no, oh. I'm sorry, not true. Nutrition is. <coughs> well, actually, there are concepts about understanding healthy habits, eating habits, and things okay. like that. So, you just kind of touch on that. So, if they don't get it, then they'll. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you know. Yeah. Just like you don't want your kid to stop with elementary school English, you know. Do you want them to stop with elementary school nutrition? It's a continuum. Yeah. Are they going to understand the difference between HDL and LDL? And you know, so probably not. Right, right. Again, <laughs> that's, 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 that's approximate determinants is when it's too late. Um, so they make a couple of um, recommendations for um, schools, right? Um, oh, this is gets back to that question about Mexico. In Mexico, food sold at schools is often from small um, vendors. Um, in New Brunswick, students are buying lunch, right? They have a stigma of eating traditional foods. I think you can't underestimate that. Again, they're trying to fit in and be American. Um, uh, and so they, they're recommending this, uh, well, there's a New Jersey Fresh program um, to introduce vegetables, uh, increase community gardens in schools. I think that's one of the movements, right? Is to really um, try to make that a, a part. So again, these are their concluding thoughts, not mine, but build a nutrition education into me Mexican diets, um, a problem if it's not in the schools. Um, emphasize freshness of foods, maybe have, this is local um, stuff, which I think some of these answers will probably come from local efforts, right? Um, and um, yeah, to again, accommodate complex family schedules. Um, oh, this gets back to, uh, who was asking about the, I think Reginald. Reginald was saying that in a previous uh, one of the uh, previous presentations, she talked about different rates of diabetes in yes. some of these rural communities. So this is just to talk about kind of the role of pre-migration diets in terms of immigrants and immigrant families, um, and what happens when they get to the U.S. and how do we see this worsening of, of outcomes. Um, so you know we have to. Uh, Obviously, when immigrants come here, they don't wipe the slate clean. Um, they bring with them dietary uh, practices and influences from where they're um, coming from. And some of this has to do with um, the timing of the, of the nutrition transition. So this is the idea, right, that as countries move um, from less developed to more developed, um, industrialized uh, countries, kind of food availability and preferences change as well. And it's a move from um, more kind of fresh, locally produced foods to pre-processed foods that you can buy in these giant um, supermarkets. So immigrants who come from countries who have not yet transitioned from these agrarian rural economies to these industrial one, industrialized ones may be more enticed by the newly available array of unhealthy um, yet easy and, this is, and quick, cut off here though, um, <coughs> options um, in the U.S., right? So this idea of where an immigrant is coming from and the pace of the nutrition transition in their um, sending community um, so when we think about, um, you know, in Mexico being an example, the nutrition transition is happening in a very uneven way. So in a lot of these rural communities, um, kind of a lot of the um, occupations that involve very high levels of physical labor and farming are being phased out, right? So this is tied to these geopolitical treaties like NAFTA. Um, so there's an increase in sedentary lifestyle. People are not spending the same amount of physical activity in their jobs, but they still have these very um, kind of calorie-rich diets. So that might be one of the reasons that in these rural areas in Mexico we're seeing some of these really high rates of diabetes, one hypothesis. Um, so this is, again, coming back um, from my study that I, we found that immigrants from regions that were further advanced in the nutrition transition were less likely to change their diets when they got here and less likely to eat meat and junk food. But immigrants from Mexico, South and Central America, where the pace of the nutrition transition is slower, really cons experienced considerable diet change when they got here, including, again, this increased consumption of meat. So this is one of these areas that we have to um, be attentive to. Yeah. So I was wondering, the first two waves of immigration, mm -hmm. um, did they have data about the inter, um, as far as their health? Oh, that, <coughs> that's, a good, uh, that's a good question. Let me go back a little bit because I feel like I did look at some of this literature um, for my 
uh, dissertation. Um, in general, I don't think we saw these same patterns of a healthy immigrant effect because certainly the public perception, I'm thinking of the second great wave around from southern eastern Europe. Remember, they, a lot of these immigrants came from Ellis, through Ellis Island and they would turn back a lot of the immigrants with any kind of health condition, conjunctivitis, tuberculosis. I mean, these were, so in that, in no sense that there was this impression that immigrants were kind of less healthy um, and they did not, you know, so it's, it's, this is, I think, very new to this wave of immigration, this paradox. And plus back then, maybe they had less processed over here, like less processed food. Oh, for certainly, yeah. yeah. Just from their local neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean, maker. right, there's been a lot of change here in the United States. That's yeah. it. That just yeah. remind me of something. Can you explain, <coughs> I don't know if you know how to do this or not, but they were talking yesterday, we went to the restaurant, and they were saying this was Mexican cheese, and so I was just asking about what's the difference, and she wasn't really, I guess it's just not as, uh, they don't put it in the preserves and stuff. Yeah, it's that, fresh. So it's just, instead of how we get in the store, it's been around for who knows how long, they put some stuff in it, seal it, I buy it, it says, you know, like, I don't know, I was just kind of like, I didn't know what the, you know, I don't know. What the big know. differences are, so with, you know, these fresh cheeses, I know, you know, when pregnant women aren't allowed to eat fresh or raw cheeses because there is a risk that they have, you know, some, um, they have been, uh, Pasteurized. Pasteurized, right? So there's this, yeah. right. So these Mexican cheeses that, that are uh, raw, I don't know the terminology that they use. Uh, Rest them. No, I'm joking. I mean, I don't know what other than that. Yeah, they, they haven't been pasteurized. That's the big difference. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they expire so a lot. So we view it as ours is safer because it's been pasteurized and processed, right? Yeah. More. Yeah. So the other thing with those queso fresco is that they don't go through the process. I don't know what it is to make the cheese the way it is, but it doesn't have all the enzymes that the cheese like Romano or mozzarella gets when it gets processed. Yeah. Uh, so it has less steps, if you know. I do so think that, yeah, I do think that they're probably, that they're less fat in yeah. the fresh cheeses. Um, and so in that sense, they're probably healthier. healthier. Right. Because, I mean, I know health-wise they act like eat the uh, cheese, made it goat's milk. I mean, there's different ways, I yeah. guess, to go about it if you're yeah. not trying to be healthy. And I was just yeah. kind of like, I don't yeah, know. It's an issue with the milk, you know. Now we have almond milk, but different, you know, fresh milk. If you go to the Amish community, you know, you get the real milk. You know, that's not good. Yeah. And you think, you know, it's better that, you know, that the real milk, so, you know, it's, what you believe and what you eat. Yeah, just a quick question, yes. yes, for understanding. The transition is typically slower because the sending community is more agrarian or because the types of foods are more dissimilar or what's the rationale? No, I, the slower, I guess, right, that's maybe in, in comparison to how it's unfolded in um, industrial countries, you know, now going back half a century or so. So it's maybe not a super fair comparison, but the real important point I think is it's more uneven. That, you know, in some areas, that in like Mexico City, you know, you know, they've made the, the transition and then more rural areas, it's, they're still predominantly agrarian, but then there's, you know, changes in terms of the occupational um, structure um, that's not keeping pace with the diet. Um, I think I'm out of time. So uh, thanks for your question. Thank you. Thank you.